So I think we're live now. This is the first time I've had you on this channel, other than like the Rule Zero stuff, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. No, I've been on your show before. It was a long time ago, though. Yeah, you and you know what? It, more than you had me on your show. I know, but you know what it is? It's it's my stupid pride. I'm like, you've already got the hit book and the big podcast, and I'm like, you know what? I don't need his help. I can do it on my own. <laughs> Even though it's like, fuck, we've been talking for two years. Why not? Talking with you. <laughs> <laughs> but but this one, I definitely need you because mm -hmm. it's like the religion thing. Obviously, you did the religious book, and you're American. No. And I and to be fair, like Dalrock, I've read, <laughs> yeah, I've read like Threat Point from Dalrock. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the other one? And there was like a couple other ones that had like multi part series there. I know it, they're like the few articles that I can't just rattle off the top of my head. So like that's how inadequate I am on the religion side of things. The romantic so. ideal was something that we discussed quite a bit. Uh, that probably makes sense too. I'll explain that later. But that's, that's good. Uh, that's um that's something he made me aware of and then we kind of developed later on that i ended up putting it's very features very prominently in the book oh so that was, and that was my first question too because as the world from what i understand and should be correct the world as it became more liberal after the scottish enlightenment has generally become more secular with the exception of the u.s now i don't know why like is there something about it? like i don't like from the red pill side of things mm-hmm from a sexual standpoint, is that some kind of difference between male virility in the States versus like Canada, for example? Is that strictly just a cultural thing and all of this stuff happens beside it? And I've been trying to figure it out and it's hard because every bozo trad on Twitter is an American Christian conservative. Yeah. And so that's like one viewpoint, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Do that mean, right? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're hundred percent right. And there's too many of them jumping into the manosphere right now, too. Um so what I dig into in the book is is I I build so like if you if, for those of you who have not read the book or you are in the early stages of write, of reading the book, each chapter builds on the one prior to it. So like in, by, by the by the introduction and the first and the first uh, chapter, you be like, "What the hell is he talking about?" And then you'll get to chapter two, and I'll mention something in like the the previous chapters, and it builds on that, and you go, "Oh, that's what he meant." And then you have questions in chapter two that are answered in chapter three, and so so on and so <laughs> forth. So that's by design. I did that on purpose. Okay. <laughs> Action adventure serial. Indiana Jones is next adventure Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the questions that you have in one chapter will be answered probably by the next, or if not that, then the the next one. This is sequentially one until you get to the very end and that's where you get the that's where you get the money shot right there at the end so um mm -hmm. but i i think one of the things that i mentioned in the in the very beginning um is i talk about um in the enlightenment uh for a bit i also talk about um i i started out with um the uh the advent the adv advent or the invention of the printing press right and in in uh, well western europe at that time uh <laughs> Aldous, was it Aldous Gutenberg? I think I forget the guy's first name, but now the Gutenberg Press, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with, and that was right around the mid 1400s, I believe. I, I could look at. I up. thought it was no. You're right. Yeah, because I was just, dude. I was telling you about the cast. We were talking about like the culturing changes. We were mm -hmm. also talking about the history of like old English serif fonts and like yeah. Adobe Caslon. I know <laughs> it's the lamest stream ever. <laughs> Fair warning. I know you and I are both graphic designers, so we know this stuff. Like I know, like I know the meaning of letting and kerning. <laughs> oh, what the, the difference that? between an what M and an N dash? It? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> what's a pica? <laughs> Don't worry about it, sir. <laughs> Isn't that a disease where you eat dirt? No, no, no. <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> You're hurting me. No, um, I, uh, so I started out with, with the, uh, the invention of, uh, the printing press, which of course increased knowledge across. I'm not going to say it was single handedly responsible for the Renaissance, but it came out right around like the beginning into the high Renaissance and it made people more literate. Uh, it caused wars because the first thing they started doing was printing the Bible. And then, so mm -hmm. all the Catholics decided, well, a good portion of the Catholics decided they wanted to be Protestants because now the lay person had access to a, a the, the Bible that only the clergy had up until that point well that was why they read it in latin back then wasn't it just because yes. then nobody could understand it yes so we don't know why we believe what we believe but now we've got the book and so and i know i've been joking around with it too like when i'm doing the promotion for the book i'll use like martin luther like <laughs> nailing the the articles of protestantism or whatever to the to the <laughs> church door it's like that's what i feel like i'm doing right now well the reason why i brought that up and and this is more to your point is 
Um, the reason why I start with that is because that was an invention that increased human knowledge and inc increased like, human information so dramatically that we, we, I don't think even to this day, we really take, we just take it for granted. A book's a book, right? I, I just probably, here's my, want to see my book? Here's my book. Um, but um, like back then, it was spreading literacy. Like, mm -hmm. like even the lay person could be literate, at least to a point where they could understand they want to read the Bible. More important thing than their whole life was the Bible, right? Oh, exactly. And then there was other, there's philosophy, and, and then that's how you get like enlightenment thinkers and you disseminate information. There was no internet to do it with. But that was, it, it, it exponentially made people, I'm not to say smarter, but certainly better informed, right? And so then you get pamphlets like uh, Benjamin Franklin during the, the Revolutionary War, right? He, he puts out uh, the Federalist Papers and everything because he was a printer. He could do that. He knew how to do all this great stuff. And so yeah. it's spreading not only, um, not only information or not only, you know, like going from illuminated manuscripts to like the Bible, it was also, here's what I'm thinking, here's a good story, and then you had authors, and that's when you, that, so it just explodes, and then as a result of that, the knowledge explodes so that you can actually, like the, the barrier to mastery was no longer about finding, a, becoming an apprentice and, and, and apprenticing with the master. You could read stuff and figure out processes and not become a master, but you would certainly have a textbook so you would understand things and read. Long yeah. story short, the, the information boom, it, it, you can see where inventions and innovation and human like like technology begins really right around there. Oh yeah, like, giant force yeah, amplifier. And to, yeah, and there's the age of industry, and then once we were able to turn that printing press into an industrial at an industrial scale, crazy, right? Well, what I've done in in the first book, or in, in excuse me, in uh, in the fourth book, is I've uh, compared the internet to an invention just like the uh, it expands human knowledge. For better or for worse, right? Um, and so, as a result of that, guys are coming together. That's how we got the Manosphere. That's how we got, uh, you know, forums and stuff. Then we moved to blogs, and then we moved to social media, and then we moved to where we're at right now, talking on on YouTube uh, with a minimum of of overhead to 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 do this. We've never in human history been able to do anything like this. No, it's but awesome. When it comes to like the masculinity side of things, like we have to remember that masculinity in like say scotland or masculinity in in uh you know western europe uh there are still similarities between not just like our understanding what conventional masculinity was back then it's also in you can look in the far east you can look at the bushido uh bushido code back in in japan right i mean there was the that was very similar to what was going on with like say the uh, code of chivalry in western europe so there was like these parallels that were going on uh, at different, you know, right around the same time, but some some longer, some earlier, whatever. But there was this understanding, and then the other part is is that right up until that, I won't say the the printing press, but certainly right after that, yeah. it, this under is this sort of I don't say it's a re reimagining or redefinition, but it is kind of re re rejiggering, I guess, patriarchy at that time. And so you get into uh, issues of courtly love uh, or the romantic ideal, which is something that Dalrock brought up. And it's, it, again, it features really highly in, in my book. But those things get into print and they get disseminated. And now everybody can read Shakespeare, right? Everybody can read Ovid. Everybody can. And so what happens is those ideals and that ideology becomes m mass media. And everybody can read it and, and sort of incorporated into their value systems or what you know what we take for granted right now is chivalry you know opening doors and <laughs> pay for the date you know that kind of stuff yeah don't stab it's him till he puts chivalry. on his armor it's don't not shoot chivalry. him when he's taking a shit it's not yeah that chivalry was a knightly code that the roman catholic church had to use amongst the military at the well what passed for the military at that time because they had to have rules because otherwise they're just beating the hell out of each other and they needed them to be yeah. organized and so that was the code and stop raping we, the goddamn uh, catholics people <laughs> women said okay okay you got 10 rules you got 10 rules in the code uh, let's wedge um uh, take care of women in the middle of this <laughs> yeah. if i remember too it was it wasn't even so much like vet, uh deify women or anything it was just like don't yeah. treat them too badly yeah and then Which that becomes, and then the, what happened is the the chivalric code became bastardized by uh, courtly love and the romantic ideal, which was an aristocracy uh, ideal that came from women who were actually you know noble you know moneyed landowners or or the wives of moneyed landowners, and they just they're they're basically the the Lord. real housewives of the Middle Ages. You know, they just wanted some you know they wanted indignation, they wanted troubadours to come in and. And and woo them, and they just they wanted to feel something, and so then that snowballed, and of course, the rest is history. 
Well, that's the part I can't, like, I've been trying to figure that one out. Because obviously, like you said, the printing press makes the high renaissance. Then the Baroque comes at the tail end of it, where mm -hmm. what's the first thing they do once they have the printing press and oil painting? Let's make Jesus look like a grubby bastard. Caravaggio mm -hmm. was like, he was like Roosh back then, except for mm -hmm. he was actually kind of cool. Although, did you hear he, what is it? He, had, he actually stabbed a guy. I Carmichael. found that out. I was looking it up, and the it's guy's name was Tomasi. <laughs> I was like, "That's hilarious." Caravaggio is a badass. I, you, you're you're going to talk art history now. People got to remember that I have two degrees. One of them is in behavioral psychology. The other one is I have a BFA. So I spent a lot of time in art history, and yeah, uh, I can tell you stories about Caravaggio. Um, you know, I did you? You probably haven't seen this. A really good series, by the way. I'm going to get really nerdy and wonky here. <laughs> But uh, art history guy in, in me, um, there's a really great series on Netflix, and it's called Medici, and it follows the De Medici family of the, oh. uh, during the, the Renaissance into the High Renaissance there, and it goes from uh, the the original patriarch, the father, all the way up through like like four or five generations. It's a great great show, but like. Botticelli is like a main figure in there, like Botticelli. Sandro <laughs> Botticelli. You know? Yeah, and then yeah, and you move on from there. It gets to the Romanticism, and that's where the courtly love thing came. And this is all going all through Europe at the time. I guess the Canadian colonies, probably to a lesser extent, but the states kind of isolated a lot from it. Like a lot of this stuff didn't make it stateside. Ben Franklin had his French fun and then left. And I'm just wondering, do you think that was a factor in why the American ideal of like masculinity differs so much from uh, like the rest of the world? That's a good question. I think that right now, I because American masculinity is, as you know, not anything like it used to be. Okay, no, like it's within the last sixty or so years is not anything like it actually, used to be. Actually, do you know what I call it now? I say it's the 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 metaphor for it is. A nine-year-old chick wearing her mom's wedding dress. Like all the parts are there, but it's just wrong. <laughs> you know. I think that we look at like our look. Like, so, like I would say, like we would have thought of things differently. I, I would say I'm not a historian, so I can't say for sure. But like from like let's just say the Revolutionary War right up to where we're at right now. Right. Like, yeah, 1776. Um, the patriarchy and the uh, the ideal of conventional masculinity they wouldn't even have called it traditional masculinity back then you're just a dude you're a man so shut up go out there and die you know go yeah. get go and do your thing right um and and you knew what your roles were women knew what their roles were and there was no there was no manosphere there was no back and forth there was no conversation you didn't need to have a conversation because there was more important things to to, to focus on at that time mm -hmm. but the patriarchy that was in, in, installed at the you know, was endemic of that time, and the masculinity that was that car characterized that time all the way up until right about the sexual revolution. Like I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take it even past like World War II. Right. It's not the, that that has become a caricature. It's it's a cartoon character that we go that we put in, uh, you know what, uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force or some shit like that, right? Or we put it in a uh, Norman the, Rockwell. Perfect yeah, example. Yeah. America, fuck yeah! That that's that's yeah. what we think of, or we think of like monster trucks and and rebel flags and all this other shit, and it's like. The, and that's by design, by the way, is to make it ridiculous just as much as it has to make Homer Simpson ridiculous or Dr. Huxtable. Oh, that's a clever ridiculous. take. Because I still think of like old, like remember Odysseus where his thing wasn't about being a tough guy, wasn't being macho. It was that he outsmarted things. Smart, yeah. 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 Smart uh, and yoked. <laughs> that's true. I guess they all were yoked. It was ancient Mostly. Greece. If you weren't yoked, you were dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was uh, uh, Gerard Butler with brains. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one, but yeah. So you get now you get this weird type of. And by the way, with invention, I find it hilarious. So what do we do? We invent the printing press and the railroad. Women have a lot of free time, and they do suffra suffrages or universal suffrage. Ooh. By universal, I mean for me, not for men. We get they get the birth control pill. They do like full on second wave feminism. Guys get stuff invented. We get invent the internet and we jerk off to porn. Mm -hmm. It's like we really are not designed to make our life better. It seems. <laughs> no, no, and I, 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 um, I sourced. I don't say source. I, I read a lot of stuff like um, Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate, uh, Modern Denial of Human Nature, which is fantastic. It's a fantastic read. I don't care what you think about Stephen Pinker. I don't care. Read that book. Yeah. At the very least, you owe it to yourself to read one book. That's that's one that you should read from 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 him. Well, and uh, I know everybody I've talked to about Pinker. They say that 
it is amazing how this man does such great work and manages to ignore all of the ramifications of it. <laughs> yes, I know. He's like one of my most frustrating guys. Like there, I have my frustrated uh, teachers, my frustrated mentors. Yeah. He's one of those guys. Like, oh, he he went to Jeffrey Epstein's, you know, what God Goddess Island or whatever the hell, you know, like his. I forget what. Where they did he pray to Ball or whatever? <laughs> oh yeah, where, where the goat heads have that <laughs> eyes wide shut party, <laughs> like newborn children. Huh? Retire like Gauguin. Yeah, I know this deal. Remember, it was that that book was written in the early two thousands before all this garbage was going. You know, we were, before we started living in the shit sty that we're in right now. Hmm. Um, but it's it's really good. It's really explanatory. Uh, also, anything by God Sod, like the uh, the his latest one, which is uh, the Parasitic Mind, is fantastic as well. So if you do, if you don't want to really read Doctor Pinker, read Doctor God Sod because it's almost <laughs> the same thing. Um, so he's really good. But I the reason I'm bringing him up is because I, I one of the, thing, the primary themes in the book is that we are too dependent on still to this day clinging to the blank slate. We're mm -hmm. clinging to the idea to the Enlightenment idea spread by the printing press and has been endemic even t in the formation of this country um, for a very long time and we still are clinging to it even though we have this mountain of forensic evidence and this empirical you know evidence uh, proof that's in front of us that says no we're not all equal and no men and women are actually different and the fact that I can be canceled or I can be lose my job at Google like James Damar, you know. Well, who's the guy who just lost his job yeah. from Apple today because he said yeah. if there was an apocalypse, his wife would be the one hauling guns and not yeah. traded for I gas. I really tweeted that today, too. That was funny, yeah. too. I was like reading that. I was like, this guy probably reads us. I don't know who does, but he probably does. <laughs> yeah, it had such a delicious tacos vibe. Yeah, it did. And, and so I think really... Um, that is one thing that is that needs to die is the blank sake. And it doesn't have to be like this. Oh, we're going to have to quit religion and we have to like all be atheists and evolutionists. And da, da, da. No, that's, it has nothing to do with that. It's just you have no. to give up on the idea that it's all, a, you know, it's all feel. You want to know where it feels before reels right now? Why we live in an age of emotion? Because we can't let go of the security blanket that is the blank slate. It's okay. Let it go. We'll live better lives if we do. True. And I know a big part of that too. It's not... <laughs> Like, I've seen this so many different live casts I've done or videos. Guys, will, you'll say blank slate equalism is bad. You shouldn't do it. It doesn't make sense. Everybody will nod their head. Of course, is that. And then as soon as you start getting into the nuts and bolts of it, they'll fight you on every step. It's like girls don't primarily care. Like the wall. Remember that little beef where 28 to 32 year old epiphany Twitter had their kept posting guys who gained some weight and saying the wall for men. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. I think i got a little agitated at that last real zero <laughs> yeah me too but whatever i was just like you know what it's gonna be fun. i put jack nicholson at 30 with a 20 year old on his thing and then jack nicholson at 80 with a 20 year old there and a lot fatter i'm like air the wall <laughs> well, one of the things that really gets me uh, this is completely off topic but one of the yeah, things yeah. that gets me about the the wall is uh it, guys are either too happy or they're too pissed off about it I know. They're like, yeah, the wall. Finally, we got, we got her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the revenge like, oh, fantasy. That'll teach that bitch for dumping me in grade six. And then there's the opposite side of that. Oh man, girls can just go to any bar and spread their legs. It doesn't matter what they look like or where they go or how old they are. There is no wall. It's just that. And it's like, shut up, shut up, please. I've heard this for twenty fucking years, man. <laughs> well, it's like you're saying it's bl it's blank slate equalism. It's yeah. guys thinking and girls both thinking that looks are all that matter. For girls, yes, looks predominantly. Nobody slept with a girl because of her degree. But guys, like you said, you have... What's the most popular photo from your damn blog that shows off? It's that stupid chart that shows the sexual bell curves over time. <laughs> and, you know, I wrote that tongue-in-cheek back in the day. I'm like, this is what I see happening. Because I saw other people... I think I was like Susan Walsh was doing these... <laughs> these and you, you probably remember what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, she was doing all these graphs. And I'm like, okay, here's a graph. And I, was, and I thought about it. That's actually kind of true. So I, I developed the idea a little bit more. Had I known at the time that that was going to be the most, in, you know, a profound graph I would ever like produce in my life, I would have took a little more time at it. But like, you can go look SMB graph on Google right now. It's oh yeah, yours is the only thing that pops up. If, if I'm famous for one thing, if I die tomorrow, they'll put that fucking graph on my head still. <laughs> the, and, and, yeah, the only variations I see is like the closer to black pill a channel gets, the more that the female chart goes to like jeffrey epstein age and i was like dude yeah. slow it down man we yeah. don't need us looking like a bunch of pedos here but whatever the other good one is uh the timeline that i did in uh preventive medicine that's uh, the one i like the most i always like 
you know how when I was talking about Soundgarden and I, you got mad because I forgot one of the lyrics from uh, from Bad Motorfinger or was I it Super Unknown? Lyrics from Pearl Jam. Yeah, but that's the thing. See, I like Yield. That's my favorite Pearl Jam yeah. album, which is nobody's favorite Pearl Jam album. Yeah. I always like the album that everybody's like, oh yeah, that was their rough face. Pearl Jam to me was kind of like Def Leppard. Like they were really good in the beginning, and then they like went like, hey, it's hysteria. You know? Yeah, <laughs> they're I, still I, out there drinking red wine, yeah, rocking out. I love, I love Soundgarden. I, I I listen to Soundgarden since like they before the eighties or before the nineties. You know, like 80s. oh, that's right, because their first yeah. album was eighty seven, wasn't it? Yeah, when they were struggling, man. Loud Love and uh, there was they had some EPs before that that were just. God. You know, I I was gonna say it's like when Chris like when when uh what was it uh, Kirk Cobain died? I'm like, yeah, you know, you know, but when when Chris Cornell took his life like not too long ago, like what four or five years. Like, Three years ago, four years ago, something. Man, that hit different. I was like, oh, oh, I know. It was the same year as Scott Weiland, like a year before that too. Yeah. So they were really just whooping our ass. Yeah. And then the dude from Lincoln Park, whose a name escapes me right now, but like he was, he did it right. He killed himself right after Chris Cornell. Jesus. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's one thing if like Lemmy from Motorhead dies and he's seventy years old and he's been drinking and you know hard living his whole. You know, okay, well, thank you for your contribution. You know? <laughs> but, like, you know, Chris Cornell had some good. You know, he was not that much older than I am. No, they had just come out with a, another album too, and everybody's worried about oh they're going to come back. They're aging rockers. Lane it was just Staley, the same. Yeah, yeah. Jim the Boomer says Lane Staley from Alice in Chains. Yeah, that that was rough too because I really liked him. But mm. you know, the guy had such a uh, like him, and then what's his name for uh, Scott Weiland from Stone Temple Pilots. <laughs> kind of figured <laughs> oh yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah chris cornell i wasn't i was i was kind of oh my god chris why did you do like, he's one he's my he is easily my favorite songwriter of all time because he was really good with his words if you mm -hmm. go if you go to the rational mail and you click on my about page it's no, i remember you got the the lyrics in there drawn flies yeah because it, <laughs> it, it describes my blog and my whole career so accurately well that's like with your band the one thing you would aspire to be is have an entire guitar tuning named after your band yeah, like that's that's how big they were. Yeah, like, uh, Rich is in the chat. It was Chester from uh, was it Lincoln Park? Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. All right, I guess we'll get back on topic. Can we ask like, what does Christopher Hitchens got to do with this? It's because I'm the secular guy. Mm -hmm. Rollo's the Jesus guy, and then Jesus and Hitchens are sitting there looking down on us from above, guys. It's a metaphor. I'm, Just I'm, go with it. I am. I am the Diane Fossey. I am the Jane Goodall. I am. Jane Goodall. Was she the ones that hang, hung out with the gorillas? Gorillas in the mist, man. I'm the one here taking notes as you guys, as the monkey's babe. <laughs> oh, so instead of the gorillas, you're looking at the autists. Fair point. I don't have my monkeys. No, I... But here's, here's my question for you. Mm -hmm. You remember uh, your article about where the guy said if it wasn't Xbox and weed, it would be something else? Yeah, something else. Yeah, it would have been something else. And I was thinking about this I for have. a lot. Yeah. And I always, Rich always shows me all those. Uh, tradcon meeting rooms there's one called literally called the man cave by the way which is hilarious on its own Whoa. um order of men it's always it's always like pursuit of excellence out on that boat yeah a viking helmet and axe on the top and i'd watched i actually wrote an article the spartan with the with the horse helm spartan that's the one and i wrote an article on it because i realized like after like the fifth guy in there order of men was a great one because they actually had a, a rule or like no more talking about dead bedrooms and stuff because it's depressing it was like such the one thing their guys wanted to know the answer to. Nobody gave a shit about trucks. How else will you get anyone here? <laughs> yeah. But then I realized all the advice falls into like five archetypes. There's a guy who's just, he wants, he wants the rules to matter. So he just tells you just double down on it. There's the guy who doesn't know what to say, but he wants to be included. So he just says a lot of words to sound like he's like the guru, the Pat Stedman type. And there's the guy who just uses whatever problems you're having as an excuse to ramble about his own problems mm -hmm. and a couple others. It's not super important. But then I was thinking like, this is so predictable. If it wasn't Jesus, would it be something else with these guys? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it would be, it, you're already seeing it is. Then you got like a guy like AJ Cortez who is talking about sunning your bunghole, right? Or, <laughs> or, well, whatever the, or t let's take ayahuasca. We'll have a religious experience. No, you won't. Your brain will turn a silly putty. That's what will happen. Yeah, and I think it's a religious experience. I, I I talk about that in the book as well. But I think a lot of these guys who are uh, who want to be gurus, and I'm and in the literal sense guru, unironically guru. I mean, look at look at Roosh. Roosh just had his a religious epiphany after like chugging down shrooms one night and said, "Okay, I think I'm Orthodox Christian now." And I'm like, "Well, 
if that that if, if anything that kind of is an insult to your religion right because all the people in your religion didn't have to take shrooms to come to the conclusion that you're coming to right now i'm well, pretty I, sure they're not they just say no yeah, well, I joke about ayahuasca a lot because I know Cernovich talks about this shit all the time because he wants to be cool. He wants to be in the ayahuasca club. Let's go to – he wants to be Goldman Unleashed, right? He wants to go out to the Amazon rainforest and trip out on whatever they're putting in the pan there and, you know, wake up a week later and go, oh, that was great, you know? And okay, but like is that religion or is that just you – why Why is it that you need a physical process to uh, attain a metaphysical state? Oh, the the old rites of passage were hitting that point now too. Hey, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's one that's one aspect. I think one of the things about the trad cons is I'm I'm sure you've heard this before. Okay, so there's the there's a blank slate. Right. There is the myth of the noble savage, which, mm -hmm. which is, means nature. If it's natural, it's good, right? Yeah, I watched Avatar. I get the I get the spiel. <laughs> exactly. That's that perfect example. That is the the myth of the noble savage. Like you know, <laughs> oh, it's okay that that lion is eating that <laughs> that gazelle. It's okay. It's natural. Yeah. Um, and then there is uh, the ghost in the machine, and the ghost in the machine is what um, what most trad cons will still uh, they they don't know that that's what they they believe but ghost in the machine that, correct is that the well, one where like it's unknowable irreducibly complex well, and it's it's that you have some sort of operative spirit that is uh opera that is uh animating the the physical right it's the the ghost in the machine the ghost is is animating the machine and once if, when you are born you, the ghost enters and when you die the ghost leaves and um Again, there's you gotta read Stephen Pig. You gotta read the, the I, I gotta read book four. I'm not gonna lie to you, Rolo. It's on my list, but I'm like two more books to go and then I'm at it. <laughs> I um so so I when I talk about the guys who are sort of um the, the I don't call them grifters, but I guess they are like I, I made comparisons to a lot of the guys who are want to be in the manosphere, but they want to cater it to fit their ideological like their belief sets. Mm -hmm. And so it, yeah, you'll get like it's. I, I I hate to keep picking on Candace Owens. I'm sorry. I'm going to mention her name again, but oh, that's so fine. We're very anti women No, it's, but it's, not, it's not so anti women. It's like anti Prager you, right? Or it's anti. Um, like I, I and it's not that I, my 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 mother in law says uh, she knows who Candace Owens is of all people, and she says uh -huh. why, don't you, why don't you like Candace Owens? Like I, I, I kind of got a love hate relationship with her. Yeah, well, like as a person, like, like the person, hate the brand. I think that's a fair like, assessment, right? I mean, she does give me a lot of material. I'll give her that. <laughs> but um, but she she's a I, she's a prime example because what happens is they are very stuck on responsibility. They think that the cure. <laughs> <laughs> I think the cure to, they think the cure to, um, to masculinity, uh, our crisis of masculinity. They'll they'll go and get Warren Farrell on there, and they'll get all the stats, and they'll they'll say this is what we ought to do, and we need yeah. more. Need to t and fathers need to be fathers, and they need to men. We don't need less mas masculinity. We need more masculinity, and men need to take responsibility and t responsibility and responsibility, and it never comes back to authority because as soon as you insert the word authority then they have a problem with that. Then well, yeah, because you're telling women what to do then. Yeah, because, and you know what? Prior to the sexual revolution, we wouldn't be having this conversation because it was, part, it was baked in to conventional masculinity right up until that point. And now since we've given women essentially unilateral control over the human reproductive process, in doing so, we have ceded authority in a way that human beings and human males have never done in the history of planet earth and, and i so, think that's a problem that it was so ubiquitous is that we it it was like asking a fish what water is they don't know mm -hmm. same as it, us for like masculine authority in the ages of you had to save your girl from bear attacks and rape gangs otherwise you know mm -hmm. yeah well she never went anywhere without her father I mean, right i i made the con like like i um i and i'm i'll put credit where it's due i talked to uh, back in the way back in the foggy days of uh, rule zero and that other uh, show we used to do <laughs> I talked to Turt Flinging Monkey, and we had comrade. I, I still, I don't have any problem with Turt Flinging Monkey. What's no, he, he's brilliant. Honestly, I, he literally I, is I going his own way. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, I like uh, like a guy like Milo Yiannopoulos or uh, Jack Donovan, although I think he's heterosexual. <laughs> but oh, Jack okay. Donovan, or these guys, <laughs> that's like, the spirit. Never give up. <laughs> well, I think that they, I think they have a lot to contribute to the conversation that is conventional masculinity. Particularly, Jack, Jack mm -hmm. Donovan, brilliant. But yeah, you know, I maybe I don't dis I maybe I disagree with how he puts it into practice personally. But you know, I still think you have a, a, a good a good message. And I, I'm not saying that a lot of the guys who are in the uh, tradcon griftosphere 
don't have a good message, but it's an incomplete message. And I don't think they do though. Mm -hmm. Like here, Grifter, I actually was like, what the hell is a Grifter? So another Canadian content creator kind of walked mm -hmm. me through this. We did like an entomology thing. Entomology, I think is the word history. So grifting, it used to be called a graft. A graft is like a shovel full of dirt, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea of somebody running a graft was the idea of a big, elaborate, like scheme, pyramid scheme. And then somebody thought it was really clever. Well, if a graft is this big, ostentatious, you know, swindling a town out of money and then sneaking off, what mm -hmm. about these other guys? And they called it a grift, like a mini graft mm -hmm. for people who are doing it with the mm -hmm. least amount of effort mm -hmm. possible. And I thought, oh my God, that word is so much, it's so perfect because it is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick on Pat Stedman because I pick on Pat Stedman and he's a great example. Mm -hmm. I consider it a grift because... He didn't do any research. He's literally just flying off the seat of his pants with like the ghosts and the Illuminati. He watches Facebook posts like you got an evil psych degree. He's for nuts. fuck's sakes. He's nuts. You went. How many people did you interview? I'm not even talking about like the book research for book four. How many people did you interview just to get perspectives? How many people did I not want to interview? For this? <laughs> yeah, better. I had once once I excuse me, when, when I was uh, when I was doing the show with Pat Campbell, I had so, and I, because he would bring it up from time to time on his show or on my show. Yeah. And, and he'd be, I, as soon as I mentioned, you know, well, I'm doing the research, I'm doing this book called, on religion. He was very excited about it too. Um, but um, the, uh, he's actually one of the, I, I put him in the credits at the end of it. As well. Oh, that's nice. But like I had, um, I had people who would just email me out of the blue and some of them were really like really good leads like uh, Rabbi Kaba, who I still talk to like almost weekly right now. Mm -hmm. He was, I, I, bought, I had him on my show on the uh, religion, the red pill, uh, Abu American's a good one. Um, I talked to, and those are just the people I have on my show. So I'm having conversations with people on the, on the email, you know, back and forth and yeah. Yeah, and 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 so that that con those conversations were really good because sometimes I would get in like I didn't want to get too one sided with one particular religion or another. Right. So, because I I had to I was going to write it from a Christian perspective because that's really my frame of reference. But I had to also consider Hinduism. I I'm, these are the things I mentioned in the book: Hinduism, well, all the, all the Abrahamic religions, obviously Judaism, mm -hmm. Muslim, and Christianity, and then uh, Hinduism for a little while. Uh, uh, Krishna, because by the way, uh, Krishnaism is one of the fastest growing um, Eastern religions, Eastern philosophy. Really. Amongst Western women right now. Oh yeah, yeah right. Gabbard, of course. They get, Tulsi Gabbard. They is, do yoga and they get they give they give snacks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it's very appealing to them because it's almost like Jesus without the judgment kind of thing. Yeah. And um and then uh what else was I? Oh, uh, Baha'i Faith was another one. Um, the Sikhs, man, Sikhs are actually my favorite. I I that I I got an education in Sikhism and I thought they were I thought that was fantastic. awesome, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's a whole community grew up in my small town, so I kind of. Ate samosas and macaroni and cheese as the Canadian. And God knows how many different like sort of franchise or sub sub franchises of Christianity I talked about or I got into, you know, sort of picking apart yeah. more. You see what I mean, though? This is why. And I know you're super kind about everybody has a place at the table. And this is not me just fluffing you, even though it kind of is. But mm -hmm. like there's work there. Mm -hmm. You could call you could say Rolo Tomasi is a grafter, but you can't say he's a grifter. I'm a carpet bagger. <laughs> Let's call me a carpet. Bagger. I'm a cult leader. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, if I wanted to be, if I wanted to be like very like uh, argumentative or adversarial with you, I would say he's a grafter. But you can't say you aren't putting Molly in work. Puppet master. <laughs> Same thing with like guys like Rule Zero and the Married Red Pill. Mm -hmm. Everything I ever say on my videos is always based on there's about hundred guys or like every article from Rational Mail is because you've had probably fifty guys doing something consistently mm -hmm. to the point where you actually recognize enough and could wrap an article around it. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what a lot of people miss about this stuff. Back to the original topic, which was then Gutenberg mm -hmm. and how masculinity or like the idea of what masculinity was or what made a good man, I guess they would have said back then or a virtuous mm -hmm. man. It mm -hmm. all kind of amplified when people are able to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was asking you before, if if it wasn't Jesus, would it be something else? Because it seems like it's almost mm -hmm. a cyclical process, almost like it's not a failure of men. It has to you know, be, it almost has to be now. It almost has to be something else right now. Yeah, environmental or technological, but definitely not just like, well, men aren't taking enough responsibility or doing whatever. It's like, well, were they doing that either? Like, what was that cult? I want to say it was in the 1800s. Like Rasputin, around that time. There was a bunch of cults where they had, where they invented, uh, what the hell was it called? What's that thing where you, where you 
penis and vagina, but you don't move. Soaking. Soaking. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I know we're hitting all the. I, mean, I yeah. I don't hold back. But they were talking about soaking as a religion. Oh, he was the the guy who assassinated President Garfield. That's the one mm-hmm. I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm. Turns out he was part of this religious cult that essentially was like everything you think of with the with the poly we're talking about. Now I don't know if you've heard about it. I can't remember the name of the cult, but Molech. <laughs> nice. Bring your babies. Yeah, but it was like no relationships exist. Every couple is communal, as much sex as you want to have, but the girls get reproductive control. Obviously, the cult died out around that time, and the guy who assassinated Garfield, funny enough, and you're going to love this, he was like an incel. He was in this free love commune, and none of the girls wanted to fuck him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's the, um, what's the one that I, I, I just tweeted this? I think you saw this article, too. It was the orgasm cult. The, or Like, if you have an orgasm, like, you're brought to orgasm in some way. It's supposed to, like, in, you're supposed to see God or something like that. And oh, it's like, geez. all it is is, like, these frustrated guys who never get off. And it's nothing but women getting off, either from other women or from, from guys. And it's like, how do you keep a cult like that together? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think it is a long-term thing. Like, those guys are going to get frustrated yeah. and start renting vans pretty soon. Well, I mean, there's the physical aspect of it too. So that's, that's something that I uh, I think that's really the operative premise of the book is like, what is it that we do evolutionarily speaking that we have to find some sort of like metaphysical reason for why it exists, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I go through the process of how like human beings went from being like, tr- you know, when we're in tribes, when we're in small little tribes, and suddenly we have the lightning spirit or we have the, the creature in the jungle that's there to kill us, right? Or there's the snake, ah, the snake, right? Or, yeah. the, um, or the mountain spirit or the river spirit. And so it's like these natural, na- so we, and we apply them because we don't, we, back then we, sorry, we, we didn't, um, we didn't know, you know, the mechanics of it. So we, we applied some sort of like spirituality to it. It's almost shamanistic, right? We apply spirituality to, to these, our natural phenomenon. Those then became Thor, God of thunder and lightning, right? And right. Oh, who's the all father. And so then you have the, the, uh, the panth or I'll say pantheist, the, the polytheistic, uh, polytheistic, yeah, the polytheistic uh, thing, because as cultures got bigger, they had need for more like condent or, com- you know, condensed, um, gods they had they had to put it all in one so aphrodite was the goddess of set and you can find like parallels of like i'm, I'm going to use the greek gods because that's where everybody knows but like there's yeah. parallels in like norse mythology and all these other mythologies yes yeah, uh zoroastras all yeah and so we anthropomorphized the spirit the the spirits of the forest and the spirits of the sky and stuff like that in person personages i guess and so then you have apollo and you got and you got the god aries the god of war who's mars or whatever you know the mm-hmm. romans just bastardized and said we're gonna do something with this and so from there it's like now you've got a nation and from that point you get into more monotheistic gods and so it makes more sense that it's like why would it doesn't make sense when you got enough people going does this really make sense and so now you've got you've got nations, you've got tribes, and you've got like the the population has grown to such a degree that now monotheism becomes the only real practical way to to think about God. And then also you're also looking at a, a centralization of power. And, yeah. Oh yeah, the Catholic Church. How many thousands of years? Consolidation of power. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. So so what happens is then like liter- to the point literally where you got Emperor Hirohito, who is the God Emperor. 40k. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's really where that comes from, right? So the, the it's divine right of kings, right? right? So there's no, but that's how we focus on and another great book. And Rich probably has read this already, but Alpha God by Dr. Hector Garcia, very influential on me while I was writing this because it's it's the our gods, especially from like the um, from the Abrahamic gods, are all rooted in the theme of patriarchy. So what is what is the most powerful thing we can think of on planet Earth, right? Well, it's the alpha male. It's the it's uh, the dude uh, in church. Territory, yeah, territory. The tip of the spear. Yeah, territory, um, resources, and and women, right? Reproduction. Those are you hit all three of those, right? And it's funny because those are parallels to what like uh, John from Modern Life Dating talks about: what is it? get girl or get uh, get money, get muscles, and get girls. It's the yeah, same. gym ten laundry exactly, um, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so so from a so from a patrilinear or patrilocal perspective the uh, the patriarchal gods are natural like that's that's what they're going to look like where you know, if the if horses had gods they'd look like horses too right because it's mm-hmm. our our operative state it's the only thing we can really 
have a frame of reference for. And particularly in a, in a time where we didn't have all, we had underdeveloped like philosoph philosophical ideas, certainly did not have technological base to know like the blank slate is horseshit, right? Right. Certainly not enough. And so now, and this is, I, I, I set this out from the, the very beginning, like from the introduction of the book, is that we are kind of in a state right now, really since the advent of the internet and access to like information, like in my phone, like my phone, I've got access to all the world's information at the touch of a button right now. It's the library of Alexandra. Unbelievable. Like if you would have told somebody that like, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, they would be, get the fuck out of here, right? But now it's like, we take it for granted that that's, we have access to that. And as a result of that, it's changing our way of thinking about the old order. And so I separate things into old order and new order. So there's old mm -hmm. order thinking and there's new order thinking. And that can be for our religion, like for your politics, intersexual dynamics, you name it, whatever affects human beings. We have access right now. Like I can go on, like you, you probably got into this before where you get do, dueling, uh, dueling research studies, right? You get so, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, women are like this. No, they're not. Here's my, here's my study. Oh yeah, I got three more. Bring, yeah, in, in it's this, do, you can never do that prior to the internet. That that conversation, that debate never happened unless they were really, really smart dudes that would get together at some university, you know. And that's the, it worked so slow. It was like papers, research, years in between. Yeah, now even it's, a joker, now even not even a joker like me can just go and like look up all these articles and sort of back up what I'm talking about or what what my my points are. Uh, we could never do that before, but uh, my my point is this: is that the a lot of the things that we uh, considered as sort of old order truths or old order way of thinking are being so challenged right now that um, we don't know how to how to. Uh, adapt adapt to them right and that's so when when i see like antifa and those kids out there like tearing down statues they're that's an emotional reaction and they're trying to get an emotional reaction as a result of that because the old order reveres george washington or abraham lincoln or whoever they're tearing down you know the father you know yeah. or whatever from you know whatever they're pulling statues down and because they th they don't know who they like people will say this don't they know who those guys are they or, or like Winston Churchill Nazi right on of all things and, yeah. and so you think <laughs> rationally like don't they know the history yeah they do they don't care they don't it's, care it's an emotional thing because we live in an age of emotion and the reason why we have that is because we have these old order ideals that have been sort of inculcated into the last four generations that were are supposed to work but they don't work in new order technology and new order access to information like they, we do now. And so you have this old emo, like right now it's a struggle between that emotionalism versus rationalism right now. You want to talk about blue pill versus red pill in a, in a mm -hmm. grander scope right there. It's old order thinking versus new order thinking. And everyone who's out there, gynocentric social order, when we talk about that, it's all a based on emotion, feels before reels. Men so, raise this defective women in a nutshell. Right. That's well, how I always put it. Well, you want to know why like, a guy like Kevin Samuels or the guys on like Fresh and Fit, like they have, they have, they can make a living off of that conflict. Mm -hmm. The women go in there to those shows where he'll have them on his show or whatever, and they're just like, you know, no, but this is the way it should be, and they're emotionally invested in what they think is their due. Is the it's hu as hubris as the best way I can put it, but it's like this entitlement to the high value guy. Why? Because she's emotionally invested in the idea that at some point along the way, that's what's supposed to happen. Because in a gynocentric social order that is supposed to be that it, it, the prime directive is emotionalism, that's what she gets. Guy comes on there and says no. That's not going to happen for you. You know what that is? That's new order rationality, new order reason, telling old order emotionalism, no, no, you can't. Have to it's ego versus id. The ego says, mm -mm, in a grand scope. Now, extrapolate that into social issues, political issues, religious issues. So when empiricism looks at- Too bad this wasn't 2016 because we could have a great reference for this. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, and, and I made that point and I, I made a sure, like I got, I, I quoted whisper in the book where I was talking about like the difference between like belief, belief versus empiricism. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, uh, so I'm, I'm making that point as I'm writing this out and I'm thinking, you know, that's on a grander scale. That's what we're talking about. There's this belief in these old order ways that should still work, but they don't in the new order because either it's too easy to corrupt them or it's, or, or they simply d don't stand the smell test anymore because we have instant access to instant proof that says, no, that old order belief is bullshit. And we can make a whole, we can in the manosphere, we can make a, a successful YouTube video, you know, yeah. out, 
of that. But One thing that surprises me on it too is that you, from art history standpoint, you haven't made a, equated this to photography at all and the death mm -hmm. of naturalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess for you guys, you may not know in the audience, the idea of painting Check in the Renaissance was. On Ryan. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even want brush strokes. Okay. Like, it literally had to represent the natural world. And they mm -hmm. put symbolism in there, whatever. Photography came around, and then just like Rolo, just like you've been saying for the last five minutes on how information is faster, it's easier. Mm -hmm. One tool managed to recreate the natural world better than a year's mm -hmm. worth of painting in a studio full of people. And mm -hmm. the art world went through, I would argue it's still going through, about a 200-year existential crisis of what is art now that this little magic box can rec recreate things better than I ever could. And I argue it's turned into visual philosophy now. It's uh, it's it's happening in music right now. Like what's, oh, I can imagine that now that like one man happening. band is the way to work. Well, yeah, and I I saw this firsthand because I grew up in an age where it's like you put put together, but you learn how to play an instrument, you put a band together, you learn how to record, you learn how to play together. You had to. There's a lot of things when you think about like you know forming a band in the 80s just because you like the music you're like i want to rock let's go get on stage and get laid <sighs> things that that was the reward that was so it was so worth it that you would go through all all of this starvation and learn how to play guitar and actually learn how to build how to write a song how to mm -hmm. write lyrics find the right people like like you know communication find you know networking promotion i mean think about the things that you had to do all yeah, Billy Ellis didn't do no, any of that. <laughs> no, no internet whatsoever, right? And I know because I had to do that several times during my, you know, during the eighties and the early nineties. And so I think about that, and then I had to learn how to record, and then I had to do, and and it was good because I learned a lot of other skills as a result of that. But like now, it's like. Like uh, I think it was Dave Grohl was talking about this one time. He was criticizing the music industry, which there is no music industry right now. It's all no. it's all online. Anybody can be their own record label if they want to. So you can afford to go on tour. You be my guest. You know, to get rent a bus and go book the things yourself. But um, the, the the or even the recording process, right? You don't even have to have the talent so much. You just have to know the formula. You know the algorithm of a successful song. And you put that in and you, you you key it into like, here's the process, here's what you beginning, end, you know, coda, whatever kind of thing. Yeah. And it's, it's like, why bother making music? Why not just have a computer make the music for you? Same as like photography, right? Why learn to paint? Why, why be a photo realist? Why be William Bugaro, right? <laughs> when there's photography right now. Who cares? You can just go get a good photography of the same thing where you can, you can even set up the models in the same way and it looks mm, pretty close. Yeah. Why would you do that? Well, I mean, it's the artistic process. And I think we've lost a lot of other sort of, I guess, ancillary uh, skills that are, are, are a part of that music thing. But now it's just like I'm where I'm the band I'm in right now. We we go and record. Uh, we can record at the guitar players place. We just plug right in the computer. I do my tracks and we can make it. I can make it sound like I'm playing a, you know, a, a flute if I wanted to. Yeah. Yep. It's up on Spotify that day if you want to. That's quick and that's fast. That's the thing, though. Yeah. Adaptation. <laughs> you can't take. You can't go grab and rent studio time anymore with your band. We were joking about that too, mm -hmm. where you don't, you know, put an ad in the paper and then ask guys to come in and interview them first and smoke about, out in the parking lot together. You, think about what you had to do to do that, just to meet another musician. Like we used to have to put ads in this uh, paper called the Recycler down in when I was in Los Angeles at that time. Mm -hmm. You put an ad in there and say, hey, we're looking for a bass player, blah, we, and these are our influences. And you only had so many characters, otherwise you're paying more money for it. And, and it was, you know, for a starving musician, that was, that was something. Yeah. You had to fit the most. So, so now you have to be pragmatic and you're, you're learning pragmatism. You're learning how can I promote for the minimum amount of characters in this like two line thing. And, phone number takes up at least what seven of those characters or whatever and so so you do that and then you and then somebody you've got to be around to pick up the phone you don't have cell phones so maybe you have a message machine or whatever you gotta oh well you know I, oh, i'm answering the, the, the thing yeah and so then you, you set up a time to meet with them you listen to them you got to be a good judge of character not a, as well as musical talent and everything else you got to have some sort of people skills you got to know something about psychology you got to know something about musicians as well there's so much that goes along with that and you don't even realize you're doing it. you're just like i just need a guy to play bass and that's all gone it's all gone just all like the gone. sexual marketplace the idea and this is my one 
critique. Yep. I'm fairly vocal about my critique I'm glad of you brought it around to this because I was going to if you didn't. Yeah, the the Kevin Samuels, the fresh and fit stuff. Myron's fine. I don't know Kevin, but I'm sure he's a nice no person too. Any of them. I just know what they're doing. I see the formula. Oh yeah, I know exactly what the formula is. It's six year olds having the dodgeball boys versus girls and I respect the hustle. In the same way that you have like a big throbbing dick in porn and the guy's like, that's my dick. And that's why the dick always gets like front and center and the girl's like off camera, even though it's straight mm -hmm. porn. Yep. It's like that. It's like, that isn't the girl that, you know, Myron found out in the parking lot. That's my bitch ex-wife or that's my bitch ex-girlfriend. And yeah, it's that revenge fantasy. It reminds me of Michael's story, which is actually from Dalrock. Funny enough, one comment on his blog, I know better than all of his fucking posts. But it was literally this, that Christian guy, I work hard, I take responsibility, all the mm -hmm. stuff that they're telling now, like it's brand new. Right mm -hmm. Yeah. Dalrock was writing about this. And I want to say it was 2007, 2008. I know it was like right around the time of first year Royce. I don't remember for sure though, but yeah. It had to be 2009 because he didn't even start his blog until 2009. Okay. But yeah, it's good then. I know it was before 2011, but mm -hmm. so yeah, 2009 ish. But then he eventually started talking to these college girls. They're just having fun, doing their thing, sleeping around with guys. And then he's like, hey, just so you know, guys like me aren't going to be around when you turn 30, you know. And the one girl said to him, and it's the one thing I love the quote. She's like, not only am I going to have my cake, but I'm going to eat it too. And I guarantee you when I turn 30, guys will still be lined up. Mm -hmm. And it's it's like the very quintessential red pill lesson guys need to learn is that there's no revenge fantasy. Mm -hmm. They're going to be fine because thirst is so strong. It's overcome all like the wall. <laughs> We, it defines a condition. It defines yeah. human males as well. We, yeah, we invented the dishwasher, and so women are like, thanks, now I could be a feminist. And in the same way, like girls are like, yeah, I can be a spinster at 30 and still settle down with a guy. Thirsty guys are like, yeah, we got you, fam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Which I, I think that like when it comes, like a lot of people don't realize that, you know, what they think is new and novel right now has been going on for it's not. forever. And even before I came on the scene, right? Like I talk about like how, like I'll guarantee you right around November, we'll be having the discussion about semen retention and no fap <laughs> guaranteed. And that's one that comes like every year. I'm talking about the ones that are cyclical, like four years. And then these guys come in. And I remember when black pill doomers were called what true forced loneliness. Those are the same, same dude. Same. I love this stuff. Like I'll bring up references and you'll remember the cycle before it. And then you're like, yeah, and guys were talking about the ones before that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and then the reason why you get that revenge for porn fantasy is because those guys are still, they're still blue pill. They're still they're ripping down the statues. Well, they wouldn't be same yeah, as those kids. Exactly. It's the emotionalism that goes along with that. But it is the hope that they could have something, the hope that they really want that girl who could be some. That's why I keep saying, you know, the red pill is not so you'll hate women. It's so that you won't hate them for what they can't be to you. Yeah. If you have a problem with that, it's usually because you're still stuck in your older way of thinking. The only reason you're pissed off or you seek revenge is because you still think that it's possible for that old blue pill, you know, what, you know, 2.5 kids, white picket fence and a golden retriever in the front yard can happen for you, right? No, you, the, the good news is you have more opportunity in the red pill and you can do more with it because now you know, what are you going to do? I'm going to sit here and cry. Okay, well then that's one. Once you're done crying, what are you going to do? <laughs> exactly. Once, once the revolution is over, what are we going to do? How are we going to rebuild? You know? <laughs> but yeah, I hate that white picket fence that. stuff. And that's another art reference. Norman Rockwell. So many of those type of guys oh. love pasting. Like, look, this is what they took from us. And as a kid, you know, playing with his dad and the shotgun. And I'm like, that was a cigarette ad from the 1950s written by Which Norman way? Rockwell and Reader's yeah. Digest. Mm -hmm. What's that? Which way? Western men? Exactly. It's like it, that didn't even exist back then. They use that as an aspirational model to sell dudes Marlboros. I see. Um, have you seen Tim Pool? He was he did a, a show about the fourth turning. Did you do you know what that book is? The fourth turning? I know of it. I haven't read it. The cycle of war. It's like you know how they talk about like what is it? You know, hard times create Oh good, yeah, that good reference. Times create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Hard times with that, you know, the cycle thing. Yeah, see, it's always great. There's always a way to blame guys. Turning in this, yeah, and the, and so then now I guess we're due for a world war, and I guess maybe Palestine and Israel are showing us how. We're not going to. They always yeah. joke that China's yeah. going to start a war. It's like, dude, do you know the Chinese culture, like how the oldest male takes care of the family? Mm -hmm. And there's like 25% more men than women, so they're going to be basically incels. It's mm -hmm. like they can't afford a war right now. Like the kid can't go to war. I got a family to take care of. Yeah. If they have a war, it won't be a shooting war. It will be, nope. how can we destroy your economy? It's not killing people. It's if having, anything. having your government kill people for you. 
That's how, that's pretty much what it is. It's economic warfare. Heck, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of like, you know, how, uh, China's moving down to Africa right now, right? For a lot of colonization, but what I don't know what they call it, some woke version of that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if that is their kind of solution to uh, Chinese loneliness. Mm-hmm. I'll just send them to Africa. Same way that you see so many like Brits coming back with like Southeast Asian wives when they had the India colonization. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, I mean, you see these guys who like, when I'm looking at what's going on, like and Antifa, like that went on all through 2020. Of course, it's happening in the in the election cycle. Of course, it is. Oh, now everybody, now everybody's concerned about racism and all this. Now we're we're worried about it. No, <laughs> very like why weren't you worried about it like four years ago, right? Because it's 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 political it's marketing. It's, it's grifting. Same thing. So, like, when I look at like what I look at Palestine and I look at the, the these kids running around, uh, you know, it's basically you know war, but it's gang war. They're not mm. wearing uniforms. They're not like they don't they weren't aren't issued M1 carbines to go shoot each other. They're it's just gang warfare. It's like kids fighting other kids is what it is. It's like this disorganized mess. And I think what if I'm scared about one thing, it's like we're primed right now for one leader to come kind of step up and start like organizing these guys to like cause once they got nothing left to lose, they'll listen to fucking anybody at that point. And so that's if there's anything that kind of concerns me, maybe that's it. But like, we're, I'm not saying we're beyond war, but like we do it in different ways now. It's like sociological war. If I can get your government to starve people, to kill people, why would I send my guys over there with a bullet? It costs me more for the bullet than it would for me to convince you, like through propaganda, to like starve out those people or to to you know uh, corral those people or to to piss off enough people in your own country that they overthrow you. It's, does that not have the same effect as war? No, I agree. Yeah. And then I guess means little pivot then back to the last point here. Yeah, sure, sure. So here's my other question. It's a kind of an open question for the both of us. Were there actually like the patriarch alpha males back then? Or are we falling for propaganda? It's wrong. What I mean by that is like uh, female protection. You know how everybody's like, you got to protect women over everything. Men prefer women over men. Women prefer women over men. Was it like the beta male strategy? Was it just the successful survival strategy and this alpha male patriarch thing was just kind of like added in there as a propaganda i don't think because because we... nobody nobody's old enough to remember further back than like 20 years that talks about all this stuff people have people mm-hmm. don't even remember 2008 and they're talking about housing bubbles now so like yeah no i think uh it especially when it when we're talking about trad cons and we're talking the traditional conservative way of thinking mm-hmm. right? that's old order way of thinking let's just let's just throw that out there right now it's old can i order- can i call it a caricature of old order thinking it can be, yeah, but what, right. the reason why I say that, and, and it's, uh, I understand like why it's fun to poke fun at it, right? Because you see guys in their Spartan helmets and let's go, like, you know, tough mutter, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <It's fit. laughs> Let me tell you about Jesus. Um, <laughs> but um, there's this idea, I think, and, and it's not just about guys, because women do this too, okay? This is just a human thing, because we tend to romanticize eras prior to where, we, like, if you go to a Renaissance festival, guys in the SCA, Society for Creative Acronisms, or if you, like, play historical war games, or if you, like, watch, do you like gladiator movies? If you like <laughs> those kind of old things, like, where you kind of get off on, like, 300, right? Or you, yeah. or you like, uh, and I, I don't, I'm, I love it, man. I love to watch like uh, old, like especially like Master and Commander. Like guys in, in Masculine Geek will probably have a billion movies to, to talk about, but they're all. Oh, dude, on. I'll watch Predator. Same thing. Yeah, well, Predator's a little different, cause, but I'll, but well, track with me. <laughs> gotcha. I, 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 Predator's a little, I, and it follows the same uh, ideas, but so. W- w- humans in general tend to romanticize earlier eras and like, wouldn't it be great to live back in, in the Renaissance time? And, and like, boy, wouldn't that be fun? We'd have this flowing romance and da, da, da. like, no, you'd have the black plague. Yeah, pretty much. You know? Or you would have like, Oh boy, wouldn't it be great to reenact like these guys I used to know in Florida who were civil war reenactment guys. And it's great when you're sitting around the campfire and you're like, you know, eating beans out of a can or something like that. And you're pretending you're like, you know, some, some soldier back then, you know what? Those soldiers hated that. They don't want to be there. They, that wasn't romantic to them. They were going to more likely to die a diarrhea than a gunshot or a bayonet. Yeah. But it's easy to romanticize those things. And it's easy to say, like, I, I looked at this, uh, in the greatest generation and I was looking at some stats for, uh, child illegitimacy like born out mm-hmm. of work, that kind of thing I, i've used this example Ooh. before how there's 
um, like in Holland, right after post-war Holland, they would drag the women out into the streets and they would rip their hair out and cut their hair. If they were like collaborating with the Nazis, right? They were Didn't like the French have a thing like that too, French, but they were worried about the French Gucci, bloodline. Gucci French, right? Yeah. And so in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, of course the men, they just dragged down the street and shot. Okay. But for the women, they had to like shame them and they would like brutally just chop their hair off for having like banged the Nazi officers that were occupying Holland at that time. And I, I use this, I usually use this example as a, um, a, uh, an example of hypergamy, right? Because hypergamy doesn't care about national interests. It only cares about reproduction and getting on the winning side. And those, mm -hmm. those chose the wrong side. Hypergamy supersedes national you know, patriotism. It, it supersedes that. And so I, that's what I usually use that as an example for. But it's also an example of like a lot of people tend to romanticize and say, well, the greatest generation, uh, you know, grand, grandpa never would have done this. It's like, no, if you go and you look at the child illegitimacy of that time, they weren't any different than than we are right now. We, they just didn't have legalized abortion, right? There was still child illegitimacy for for women who were married and their husband was a GI in the South Pacific and she had a baby and she gave him the Dear John letter. She hooked up with somebody else and that was that, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, illegitimacy of women having, you know, becoming pregnant by getting with Nazi Nazi Germans, right? And so there there was that. It's like humans are humans no matter what the period is but we tend to look back on those things and go men were men back in the greatest generation it's like yeah and women were women <laughs> we all had the same impulses and we and your mom and your at some point your grandfather your great grandpa saw your great grandma and said man i want to tap that yeah or what did nick say she undressed for sailors <laughs> yeah <laughs> but and i think that's a funny thing too with your netherlands one because a lot of guys and it's guys who are blue pilled they still don't understand they seem to think that women are at the same time goofy bobbleheads that are just running off of emotions mm -hmm. and, you know, Machiavellian masterminds with cunning plans. And you've made a great example of hypergamy is not like some perfect roadmap. Some girls are still going to make stupid mistakes, even if they follow their hard wiring. Mm -hmm. It's like well, diabetes. We're hardwired to find carbs. But if you eat a bunch of sugar, you're going to get diabetes. So it's not exactly like helpful. It's almost, it's funny to me, like a lot of the people who will, ex like, especially in, like, who are still old order thinkers, believers, right? Mm -hmm. Old order thinkers, older believers. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I, honestly, I make a case in the book that I still think that we need metaphorical truth. We still need belief. We still need hope. We still need to have magical thinking because that's what prompts us to like inspiration. It puts us so we can get to the next, uh, the next, um, you know, well, what if, you know, what if we did this? I think more for men than women in this case, but like, because men tend to be more idealistic. Like what if we could put a colony on Mars? <laughs> what if she was loyal? <laughs> well, to get to, to get to, how do we do that to make that a reality? We still have to have the belief that it could be done in the first place. Right. We're magical thinking like though. So we'll make movies about it mm -hmm. first. The Martian, which was actually a pretty good movie. Or, or the really bad one, which is, uh, what is it? Uh, Total Recall. <laughs> you know, but Dude, I'm so I, sad with that disclaimer the DVD has. <laughs> yeah, science fiction has to be, like, we have to have some sort of belief. And I think that it's, I, honestly, I don't think you can pull it out of the human animal anyways. We're always going to have magical thinking because it has served us so well for so long. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when that belief and when that magical thinking becomes unhealthy, and it leads to other like our detriment then yeah then i can i can sort of get i want to talk to you about metaphorical truth because i know we've talked about this before and i don't know if we've ever done this on a on a no no we haven't and i use the same but i use the firm sexual diabetes mm -hmm. so that romantic thinking like romanticizing age has gone past is part of that magical thinking like wouldn't mm -hmm. it well, it was would have been so great i mean well, i i'm ashamed to admit this but it's one of my guilty pleasures my, my wife and i've been watching that show outlander on on netflix it's basically a um, oh, is that the one that the yeah. Nazis won? No, 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 no. You're thinking of Man on the High Tower. No, oh, it's, okay. Um, and uh, I was stupid. Um, <laughs> but the uh, Outlander is essentially a. Uh, it's a. There's a lot of nudity, a lot of sex, and damn near every one of these things. But it's like, um, uh, it's a. Uh, it's a romance novel essentially. It's a. It's a hmm. serial. They're gone. They're on like season six on Netflix now, and it's it's really good because it's historical. So it's it's got enough like of that like romantic ideal for women because it's it's like oh the woman it's, it's comp i look at the formula and i go oh god this is so schmaltzy but it drags me in because it's like well but the guy that she falls in love with is a scottish highlander in 1768 oh and it's the chick that goes back in time 
you know, clotting more and they're about to smash each other with like, you know, whatever, uh, claymores, you know. And so it draws the guys in. It's just historical enough to just scratch that 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 romanticization itch for guys like, man, if I would have men were men back then, I, I can totally see how like concern like trad cons would love that show because it still it still builds those guys up but at the same time it sort of feeds that fantasy of women at the same time there's n- i have no doubt that it got popular and it's six seasons in because of exactly that romanticization and it's that magical thinking she has to go back in time literally has to touch yeah. like stonehenge and t- go back and- <laughs> where have all the good men gone <laughs> so you have to suspend disbelief and so yeah really oh, yeah they're back in like 1768 or something like, in scotland scottish highlands right Jeez. but um but so there's that there, but the, the thing that gets me is there's that desire for that. And I think that that's that if there's anything that gives me hope in 2021, it's like that there's still that like it's so desirable that we'll make fantasies that that we could have this at some point. And as I said before, Patreon, I'll finish with this. Uh, uh, patriarchy what is a natural outcome of natural human relations. It's the, the most logical, most pragmatic, social, intersexual. Well, it's Lindy. Element. That we could have ever had because women need men and men need women we are compliments to one another we're better together than we are apart our, our weaknesses and our strengths complement one another and we're better as a unit that's why we're the apex species on this planet okay and the moment we start saying oh we're all the same then you throw that out the window and so when i'm when i'm talking about like um complementarity or when i'm talking about um uh, you know, sort of getting back to that ideal. I think there's still that hunger to do that. I, th- I think I think women would love to do that, and men would like to do that too. It's just that we can't find we can't find the logical way back to to getting it. Maybe the meteor has to hit planet Earth before we get to that, or maybe war has to happen before we get to get to that. We have to like you know reset the clock kind of thing. But- Honestly, I think it's going to be a temperance type thing on the female side because I noticed every girl wants to bake bread and be a stay at home mom when she's thirty. Once they start seeing 19 year olds on mass doing it and saying, no, I'd rather not go to the bar, then I'll take it seriously. Until then, mm-hmm. I'm kind of, it's kind of out of our hands at this point, mm-hmm. you know? Well, but patri- maybe I'm, I'm the jaded one between us. So take it's, it for it's, what it's worth. The patriarchy is a balance system, it's, mm-hmm. it, it balances responsibility with authority for men. So, in an idealized, beneficent patriarchy, right? Father Abraham can have two wives and four concubines, right? But he has, still has to take care of all of them, all of the children, all of the goats, all of this cattle, all of the, the shit that has to happen in the camp kind of thing. And he has to be responsible for all that. But he has the authority to exercise those responsibilities. Yeah, but we got photography now. The girl doesn't need that. Bring yeah, home the bacon. Bacon's three bucks at the grocery store. She can earn right, that. Right. But you know what? Her machine, her body, her evolved mental firmware can't figure out why it feels why she's on antidepressants right why oh, do we, i agree i need to self-medicate and the reason for that is because your body is screaming i need to to have this and i and your mind your your ego is saying no you can't have that you will be a strong independent woman if you do that bullshit well, well that's and this is my art reference to why i think photography is the perfect analogy because that hundred years of abstract expressionism all the way up to guys like guy that took like a shit on a canvas and charged a million for it to the banana Mm -hmm. i think in the sexual marketplace we're kind of reaching that where everybody's just throwing shit against the wall hoping something will stick out i don't Mm -hmm. think we'll find a solution to in our lifetimes either but we have like what jeff miller is talking about dude you got to go full poly let your wife sleep around and just hang out and be the better guy or uh uh, abu saying i want to have three wives and do the exact (laughs) opposite and Mm -hmm. I'd argue we're kind of, and I'm, even me, I'm like, there's no reason to get married. Common law is just fucking fine anyway, but, and I'm, I don't know which one's going to win out of all this. I really don't, but I know something's going to come out of it that's not going to be old order, but it'll still mm-hmm. scratch that itch the way you're putting it. I, I were, the only, my, and I agree with you, but I think that the only hindrance right now is that we found ways to monetize keeping <laughs> us in state, you know, keeping us in this state. So OnlyFans, for example, why would a woman ever want to even get, uh, go to college at this point you know women's college enrollment is like through the roof it has been for a long time you put another an invention like like become a essentially become an online prostitute with a minimum of effort and why would why would that's going to change things up and in the book by the way um mm-hmm. I, I mentioned like when, when i was talking about the gutenberg press uh i i make the allegory the metaphor because i can do that in my book and i can't do it online right <laughs> I told him, I said, you know, uh, it's like uh, the tr- uh, uh, the apple that fell from the tree of knowledge. And every so often an apple falls from the tree of knowledge 
and we eat it and we become smarter. So like a, a, uh, the Gutenberg press increased human literacy and made us smarter, made us more aware of what was really going on. And that's why you get the Protestants killing the Catholics and, you know, and everything else. Um, uh, nuclear weapons, good that, oh, photography. That's an apple that fell from the tree, right? Uh, nuclear, nuclear power, apple industrialization, all of these things, you know, by, by, you know, greater or lesser, I would also include hormonal birth control as one of the greatest apples to fall from, because it's one of the most upsetting, um, you, you know, uh, I don't even know what to call it. Like it distorts human relations to such a degree that we, you know, it's like in that, uh, what is it? In well, it removes the bottleneck. Yeah, Jurassic Park, right? It's it's a uh, it's a but not light finds a way, but it's um you don't you, should we have done it, right? Is it a you know, you, we we wanted to figure out can we do it rather than should we do it? And now we have the internet and what's happened now is we're not ready to resolve old order beliefs and magical thinking and have those destroyed by new order empiricism that we see every day like we keep saying like if you erase me you erase ryan you erase rule zero you erase the manosphere you erase everything we've ever done guys are still going to see that because we have we're good they're still going to be red pill and they're still at some point they're still going to follow along in this because they're going to go it's unignorable this is something's not right and oh yes yeah, the law of large numbers eventually somebody else will come to the conclusion on their own and we have more access to do that now because we have mass communication so well and I guess that's a good thing to end it on there. I hope you guys learn from this one. I don't know. I like it. Rolo and I, we don't talk a lot. and But the times we do, it's always... Do you know what I miss? Hmm. It's that we always have to sit... Like, I have to do a meme about how ate shit. You got to go on fresh and fit. And it's like, hey, Miami girl, go back and hug your dad. And mm -hmm. But we don't get to talk about this shit. <laughs> this is so yeah, much because, fun. I mean, because you have to... It, it's not... <laughs> It's not sexy, right? It's not like hold hold someone's. No, this is this is C-SPAN doing a congressional hearing on wood agriculture well, or something. You no, know, it's it's look. We're making sausage. Don't look at making sausage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to look at this sausage. I want to eat the sausage. Just politics and making sausage, right? You don't want to yeah. see it made. That's really what the red pill really is, because we keep calling it a praxology and not an ideology, and that's the way it ought to say it stay. But that doesn't make it pretty. It's still making sausage at the end of the day. No. Well, dude, you see how slow I'm growing. That's because I've stuck to it as much as I possibly could. And I knew going in, doing that, I'm fine with it. Somebody's yeah. got to do it. Well, it's it's staying. I have, and this, I, I lifted this from God Sod, because God Sod says this all the time. <gasps> I have, <laughs> I, he probably got it from somebody else too. Uh, I have a an obligation to objective truth. And that's the one thing I feel like. And so, like, I get myself in trouble. Even Rich and, and, and John will throw rocks at me. Like, You're so under-monetized. Yeah, I know I am. But you know what? People come to me for the real deal still. Yeah, it's a choice. And, you know, I understand. Like, when I go and I look at Fresh and Fit, like, their, their after-hour shows have, like, you know, somewhere it's almost like 10,000 live views, depending on who's on there. And they go through the roof. And it's like, yeah, because that's the red meat that everybody – that's the hot thing, man. It's selling mm -hmm. hot dogs right there. But – uh, and I'm glad. And here's here to his credit, Myron still stays on point throughout the show. That's what. Oh, yeah, nobody's saying he's not good at it. Oh no, he's he's very, but he's also very. He stays on point, red pill wise. But after a while, it's the same show over and over again. And so, how do you mix that up? How do you how do you how do you save the world, right? Or are you are just going to make money at it all this time? And I don't have a problem with making money. You should, but it's like at. It's like when I was talking about OnlyFans, where I was, we were talking about how do we get out of this? How do we get out of this stasis? If we keep monetizing the things that keep us in that stasis, when are we going to get out of it? No, probably. But that's the problem: is you're you're asking for a cartel. Women will do a cartel for hypergamy. Mm -hmm. They'll do what girls have to do to keep guys on the plantation. But guys, we're too competitive and we're too mm -hmm. thirsty. I don't think we'll ever get there. It's easier it's easier to monetize men's nature than it is to monetize women's nature. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's like guys are it's like well, sex sells. That's easy, right? But mm -hmm. it's it because men are more necessitous today than women are today. Maybe yeah. in the past I would have been I would have had a different opinion of that, but men are more necessitous than women are or at least perceptively perceptually so. Like women, women think they got it made, right? They go, they, they demand, how do you create a good manosphere show? Well, you, you play on women's entitlement. Well, if enough women think, oh, well, I deserve the best of the best, you know, if he's, is he really the best I can do? Mm -hmm. 
you can that's monetizable that fear that insecurity is very easy but women believe that they are that's their due and they're going to get it at some point guys on the other hand like they're like what am i going to do i'm going to figure this out yeah they're just told to go sit down and die in a corner well if i can monetize like black pill doomers and feed them doom all the time and feed them fear and sell them security all the time I can be great, but it just, what is, how does that help like the next generation? How do we avoid the next Lost Boys generation? Not like that. Well, if you're going that route, honestly, if I was going to go that route, I would have just stuck with corporate. It pays better and I'll be able to sleep just as poorly at night. <laughs> and then at what point is it just, you, you know, it's just human nature. People are going to do what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. And it's, you just kind of, and I hate to you know, say, oh, it's I'm like the Tate model. Well, guys off. are going to be thirsty. I might as well make mine. Yeah, and then you got the guys who want to live by virtue in these old order, you know, Spartan ways, and and they want to, I don't know, drive jeeps and drink light beer, kind uh, of hunter in the shed. <laughs> yeah, and then hope that they can get enough guys to sort of be on their team, and it's like it's very tribal. I got it. I, we're human beings. We're we're tribal, but it, it's again, it's that it's that it's magical thinking that is taken to a a degree where where it's unhealthy and it's monetizable. So mm-hmm. even guys, even guys who are watching Fresh and Fit are they're they're that's being monetized. The, the same magical thinking that that applies to that is being monetized in the same way as the guys who have like liminal order and we're all gonna go you know, you know, sun our bungholes and and yeah. you know, lift no, it's, it's all the same grift. Yeah, it's grift or graft, depending on who you like and who you don't, whatever. And what gets you to the next level? What 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 pushes you up, right? What what's gonna I don't know. I, again, I, I love when they say next level. That's such a container word. You fill it with whatever hopes and dreams you want. And that's what, exactly what Rolo meant when he says the next level. Next level. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's, and then it's the, it's, it's taking authority. You want to know how we're going to change things? Guys have to take authority back. We have to find someone because you have to, and I, don't, I think guys just simply lack the will or they're too lazy or they're just too, they're not desperate enough to actually seize authority back yet. We will. Eventually we will. It'll get so bad that there'll be no other choice but to take authority back because you won't be able to uphold responsibility unless you have that authority. I do think with automation, though, there'll be like, you know, how most men were sustenance farmers. And then by the Industrial Revolution, like one percent of people are. I think it's going to follow a similar trajectory like that because of tech. But I mean, where's that going to end up with? That's that's back to like warlords and harems now. What what is Tinder if not a harem anyway? That's a great. That's a great topic. I um I've been reading this book, uh, skimming through it really. I need to do it again, but it's um, <laughs> it's uh the new feudalism. Like oh. we're, we're we're aiming towards neo feudalism right now. Like like companies are going to store are are going to be more important than national boundaries pretty soon. They already uh, are. Be who you work for and and what the subsidiary is. Like you might work for some company, but it's a subsidiary of a larger parent company, and that'll be your army. And they'll provide your your religion. They'll provide you with a wife. They'll provide you with the territory, the house you're going to live in. It's it kind of goes back it's to like fucking the cyberpunk as fuck robber barons of like the early industrial age. Only mm-hmm. like they couldn't they couldn't make that happen because of the technology wasn't there yet. But the technology is there now. So now we can have robber barons, and now we can have essentially neo feudalism. And I'm sure, are you familiar with like the first estate, the second estate, third estate? You know. Mm-hmm. Like, clergy under old order feudalism i believe was the second estate now, second estate yeah now this guy i forget the guy that, who the author was but now the clarity is the second estate which is the media which is like woke culture um, really so they, they got an upgrade they got a promotion well uh and there's they're, they're number two now uh, now i'm really gonna now i'm really gonna fry your brain is there it used to be that corporations could not control culture so they could monetize it so if like heavy metal came up as a music movement oh, i already know where you're going with this one you could take that right or what a rap music became something right and that was a, that was like the ground up like people human beings made this because it's badass and we're going to do this and they go okay we're going to take that music and now we're going to put it in our movies and our coke commercials and our beer commercials and everything else and so now companies are producing culture to feed back to human beings so it's it's no longer an organic thing it's a product that's created by a very by a very you know, f- you know precious few human beings that's fed back to human culture and it's not organic anymore and that's one of the reasons why i oh. why you get like really shitty star wars movies or really shitty you know lord of the rings Dude, i can give you a perfect example for the audience in that the pride parade in toronto i took photos same street same time of day on canada day and during the pride 
Mm-hmm. And pride was insane. There was like blocks of people. Block. Every company had banners. They had their employees there. My mom came down to visit me. She found this like very unpassable drag queen. She was taking selfies with him. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's crazy. And there's titties hanging out everywhere. I go down there for Canada Day. Mm-hmm. And even the CN Tower, usually it lights up for can- for pride. It'll do all rainbows and stuff. For Canada Day, did rainbows again. I'm like, you couldn't give me white and red one day. And I thought about it, and I was like, that makes sense, because national holidays, a company can't do, we're, we're in 20 different countries, you can't have 20 different campaigns for this, mm-hmm. it's too complex, but Gay Pride, mm-hmm. that's one event, one flag, one thing, it's mass, it's McDonald's corporate pride, and it makes total sense how they do it, too, because it's just the mm-hmm. most efficient way to manufacture a holiday. They pump culture back to the people now, because we have we have the internet, right? They, they yeah culture back to you as a product like this you're human you should like this too here you go you know (laughs) the (laughs) amazon recommendations for my life (laughs) here you you like this don't you johnny here you know yeah yeah, yeah. you know like it's culture and so they it becomes it's it's creative for you like it used to be like people will get like i talk about this when i talk about like doomers and stuff like that or, Mm -hmm. or there's no outlet anymore People would rather sit on Twitter or sit on their live stream for six hours or eight hours or whatever and talk shit about other people or talk shit about women or talk shit about this or whatever. And yeah, they, people. And they might even have a, a, a they might have a valid point for this, but if that's all you're doing, it's probably as a result of the fact that you got no other no other brain cells to work with, right? Because you're that that's so satisfying that you're not creative. You're not, lear- you're not p- learning to paint. You're not learning to play guitar. You're not learning to do creative outlets because the internet and this this culture that is foisted upon you is creative for you. So you don't have to you, you don't have to think anymore. You don't have to like like Star Wars was fantastic in the 70s because it was some guy who said, "Wouldn't it be awesome if we did all this shit?" Yeah, yeah. Let's, hey guys, let's recreate at- Flash Gordon in the 70s. Right. And so now it's like, okay, this is what you like. So here's your Star Wars, you know, uh, you know, microwave dinner here, you know, mm-hmm. and that's and so it's fed back to you, and you you don't have to be creative. You just have to collect the whatever the Funko Pop dolls for whatever they're you know they're selling oh, like merchandise. It's like that red letter media quote: uh, "Just consume product, citizen, and then sit back and wait to consume more product or something right. like that." And so what it does is it removes your well, first of all, it removes magical thinking because that's the that's necessary to the creative process. That's another mm-hmm. reason why I say that magic thinking is still it's not a, it's not endemically a bad thing it can very much be a bad thing but um it is it is necessary to ideation for human beings and so like if you if you are if you especially this if you were a creative person like like five years ago and you find yourself like not wanting to do the, the same things you really love to do back in the day give up twitter for a week oh. Give up social media for a month. You, you'll be surprised just how creative you become as a result of that because it's creative for you and it sucks, but you're a better consumer as a result of that. So you have to be really, really careful. That's like it goes back to the metaphorical truth thing, right? You know, what is what is actually empirically true versus what's metaphorically true. And if you keep stuck, if you're stuck in sort of this debate between one or the other, that keeps you in a, a, a state of stasis. So. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, what I, you're saying is that 90% of the manosphere has blocked me, and that's probably a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, you have to you have to take some time away, and sometimes that's hard to do when you make your living on Twitter, when you make mm-hmm. your living on whatever. Like you are your own brand, and you can't can't stop, won't stop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm gonna- oh, yeah. But I've seen that. How does that work? It's usually <laughs> first thing in the morning. Everybody's like, "What's the dumbest shit I could say?" And whoever's got the catchiest dumb shit. Everybody else swarms it like a six-year-old playing soccer. <laughs> when I have this, I have this morning ritual where I go and grab my uh, my iPad, and I'm about to have my morning coffee, and I'm looking at my iPad. My wife's looking at me. I go, Ah, what fresh hell awaits me? Because <laughs> 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 it's true. Yeah. And it's like you have to get back to your sort of creative center, and the only way you can do that is to sort of lock yourself out. But then, would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? You know. I think a lot of people don't want to cut themselves off from social media because they don't want to seem like they're uninformed to the point where like their life depended on them getting that one tweet. And, oh, the rioters are coming down your street right now. I'm just taking a break from Twitter today. <laughs> yeah, the rioters. That's the thing, too. A sh- yeah. shooting happens in New Zealand. I know five minutes later, and then all of a sudden my police force is cracking down. I'm like, mm-hmm. what in the f- 
Well, it's like this, and, and that's I should say also that like when I talk about like how culture is fed back to you, religion mm-hmm. is also fed back to you as well. Intersexual dynamics fed back to you as well. Oh, 100 percent. Anything that can, anything that is a even a derivative of human nature or humanity is fed back to you, and they're only getting better at it. It's only becoming more efficient. So, you know, something that I hate, you know, it sounds like really bad, but it's like that's something that you got to keep in mind. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a break from from social media or, or taking a break from all this bullshit, but you'll find out just how creative you can be if you just get these, just cut off everything else. I just want to, I, I told guys this all the time. <laughs> I, I told, I'm sorry, I, you know, I know you got to go. Um, no, no, no. It's- but I think that like we are, we've become too good at multitasking. Like, um, when, too uh, comfortable with it. I wouldn't know if too good is the right word. Yeah. Well, like when I like I was telling you before we came on, like I've been working, I've been playing with this band for about a, a year and a half now. Yeah. And the great thing about being a musician is you have to focus on one thing. How do I play? How do I my technique? How do I got to learn this song? Kind of the thing. TikTok of the metronome. You can't, have, you can't have YouTube going over here, and you've got you know something else happening. All you have to focus on only one thing. Like how many things in life actually force you to focus on that one thing we can't even drive without fucking texting right i mean you should focus <laughs> on that right but how many things in life really especially creative endeavors make you focus on only one? oh dude video editing is the only one i can come up with off the top of my head you can't even play a video game without having like the the headset on and talking to your friend yeah fuck you i killed you die you know you got all that you've got so much information so much like uh, it's sensory overload almost yeah by the way guys the streams are on monday wednesday and friday on the second channel <laughs> gotta watch them all <laughs> I, I should thank stefan molyneux i'm like i ha- i'm ha- i had my center cernovich moment you remember the one where he's like this manosphere is a piece of shit i gotta get out of here mm-hmm. kind of had that moment too but instead of just putting out everybody's stereotypical i'm done with the manosphere video then two months later they're talking about how whammon ain't shit again yeah. I, yeah, I decided I, just do something about it and then start something adjacent. Well, there used to be a time like where, I mean, losers haven't have been around forever, right? There was guys who were like the same kind of autistic guys as the losers that you see on various, you know, podcasts right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, same black pill doomers, the same like washout kids, the burnout kids, um, the guys who had to, in some way, they got hammered flat by life, right? Right. They had to find some way to either come up above that or they're just going to wallow in their misery for the rest of their lives right it's never been easier to commiserate with guys than now first of all but they also lack the creativity to lift themselves out of that state so if you're a black pill doomer if you i I keep saying there's no such thing as a black pill because it's it's there's only the red pill or and your ability to cross the abyss from your blue pill way of thinking into the red pill way of thinking pretty much and and black pill guys can't figure out what to do. They can't cross the abyss because they really wanted the blue pill to work out for them. But they see all the they have the empirical data, right? New order, the new the the empirical data and everything else that's sitting in front of them, and they can't ignore it, and they can't go back. So they vacillate in the abyss and they can't cross over. It used to be that you used to have punk rock and heavy metal and slayer would help you like cross the abyss or would you get such you would get to a point where it's like you know what um, they, even if it was motivated by revenge at least you were successful at least you pulled yourself out of that now it's like no it's more fun to just sit here in this abyss and go and cry and piss and moan about stuff because you can do it with friends now yeah because you don't have to be creative you don't have to be there the creative energy is is drained from you and you can't get out of the abyss because you're you're being you're sedated, fat and happy by this culture that's being pushed and fed to you constantly. Give it up for a while and see how your mood improves. Well, it's funny because that was the one thing I said back when Limitable Man was having his big monetization of the Manosphere speech two three years mm-hmm. ago when we first got started, saying it's bad. This shit should be free, except for my coaching. I was like, whatever. Look, the next step. I mean, when it comes to like sex, pretty much everything that needs to be said has been said. We can reword it. Everything in the rational mail, everybody said it. You had that guy asking you two weeks ago, well, what are you guys going to do when everything's been said? I'm like, everything's already been said. The best thing you could do is put it in a separate wording so that way the thousandth, thousandth demographic who still can't quite click and click on it. And I honestly think like the creative endeavors are the next step. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's talking about, I can't watch movies anymore. I can't do, I can't do music. Uh, my church sucks. It's like, well, then go make, make one. Own. Make your own. That's exactly yeah. what we said on I, last week. I was on uh, the Masculine Geek Show. Actually, I hosted the Masculine Geek Show on my show, mm. and 
that was the consensus of everybody because we were talking about like how uh, like why is it that these old franchises are being used as vehicles for woke narratives because they can they're fe- that's how you get it fed back to you yeah they can't create anything new the woke sees the woke mentality the cancel culture they can't create anything new so they take your old great stuff fuck it up pack it full of their woke narrative and they go here you go johnny here's your next meal and you eat it i can't up. tell if you're talking about chinese tech <laughs> yeah well i'm talking about star wars or something like that and you wonder same why same thing it, though they just took yeah you put your iphone plant here give us your ip and then we're gonna make our cheap knockoff that doesn't quite work and so the guys who complain about that are like the old like the diehard fans those guys get pissed off because it's like, man, we knew what the franchise was. It was so freaking good. And now, all the, you know, now the wokesters pack all their crap into it and they feed yeah. it back to us. And it's not the same. Yeah, it's not. And it never will be. It's dead. Create yep. something new. I can't. I can't be creative because I'm too busy being fed all this crap all the time. That's why you have to go and create your new religion, create your new uh, franchises, your new IPs, right? Intellectual properties. Create. Here's okay. We're gonna leave it this. Okay. Do it smart. <laughs> here's the here's the thing that gave me hope recently. Oh. In in COVID, okay, in COVID times, I'm playing in this band. We have a rehearsal studio. It's about 20 miles from where I'm at right now, and. There's, there's 14 bands that are in this rehearsal studio mm-hmm. and COVID's going on. All Every live venue is closed. You can't play out, right? That's why we, you want to know why I have a four song EP? That's why, because we all focused only on recording and, you know, learning songs and refining our craft and everything. So we took basically a whole year to do that, but because we couldn't play. It was taken away from us. We couldn't, we, there's all the bars are closed. I like working in the liquor industry was, it was like freaking desert, right? Oh yeah. I can imagine. So what had happened and I didn't realize this until like they had already started doing it. But some of the guys in some of the guys in the bands that are in that rehearsal studio said, fuck this. And they went and rented out a, uh, a warehouse, like practically because nobody's doing any business, right? <laughs> rented out a warehouse put out the word on Facebook or their social media and say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to have a, a gig. It's going to be at this warehouse. We're going to have six kegs, you know, <laughs> and we're going to, and how eighties. <laughs> exactly. It's a kegger, right? Um, we're, and we're going to have, uh, it's going to cost you eight bucks to get in or whatever they're charging to get in. And only if you're invited and, you, and here's the deal. If you come and you want to wear a mask, fine. If you don't want to wear a mask, fine, but we're going to get together and we're going to play this gig. There's going to be four bands. There's going to be six kegs. It's going to go from, nine o'clock till 1 a.m. and you're on your own after that kind of thing and you know what fucking packed and look I mean, at you back to the underground parties have to know somebody exactly. that's and that's what i was trying to say is that gave me hope because it's underground that's what punk and metal used to be they wouldn't yeah. even play at a club so rap used to be like i i think almost every jazz yeah. used to be make your own yeah you had to make your own music make your own club make your own shit and do and do it and you know what that and then of course you know corporate interests come and take oh we'll take that sure Mm -hmm. but you have to do it yourself whether it's writing the next great you know star wars novel or making the next game or or playing the next music or starting the next band or whatever and you know what you got and i I keep saying this you want to be a millionaire write red pill fiction no one's doing it nobody remembers how to do it and even if they did they wouldn't dare do it because they think i'll never get it i'll never get published you can publish it yourself do it yourself if you're that invested in the art and that's really what you want to tell and do it unapologetically, write the next mm-hmm. solo, write the next C- Captain Kirk and be a bastard about it. That's one of the, yeah, another person who gives me hope, delicious tacos. Oh, I know exactly that kind of stuff. And I know I, I, we follow each other kind of at arm's distance, but I like him. I think he likes me, but like, it's funny to watch. I love his stuff. And, and, but he, that's what I'm talking about is unapologetically sexist, unapologetic, what we would call sex. This is really not but no. unapologetically red pill and puts it out there and doesn't give a rat's ass. He's like, you like it? Great. You don't fuck you, whatever. I'm good. And you have to make it yourself. You have to go and do it yourself. Hey, beats jerking off in your living room anyway. Make All right. So with that <laughs> underground scene, make the next underground scene. Yeah, dude, that'd be awesome. All right. So we're going to end it there. Uh, Rolo, I mm. <laughs> If anybody wants to follow Rolo Tomasi and you haven't heard about yeah, that's the funny thing being the small brand. <laughs> Book four. I'll put a link to it in the description. Uh, give it a click if you haven't. The religion one. I'll put what books one, two, and three in there as well. There's always me. And thank you guys. I don't know if I can thank Chesty and Marty or not, or if you guys are just really well behaved, but 
again i take great pride in like a and the least amount of autism in a comment section on the internet so yes thank anyways you. you guys have been a great audience for paying attention thank you for being intellectual superstar. yeah and i guess thank you for coming too like i said <laughs> anytime man i'd hardly ever come on your show you should i've had you on my show lots of times I don't yeah well I'll st we'll start doing this more rich right, had me on his show on my